Hey guys, how's it going? It's Samuel He, and I'm here with an interview with Sean Bryan from, oh, sorry, did I say that name? Sean Byrne. Sean, Sean Bernie. Sean Bernie. Yeah. Bernie, okay. Sean Bernie from St. Clair Esports. Uh, just to give you guys a bit of background information, St. Clair Esports, uh, you know, St. Clair in general has the biggest by far esports program in Canada. So, uh, Sean, tell me a little bit about yourself and uh, what you do over there. Sure. So I started working in esports in approximately 2010, 2011, um, when I was still a student at the University of Windsor. When I graduated there for about five years, I worked with a few partners and we ran a, a private esports event management company. Um, we ran events all over Ontario and even as far as Quebec and some into, into Michigan as well. And eventually I got the opportunity to work on an event with um, St. Clair College and while I was in those meetings for the event, sort of pitched the idea of a varsity program. Um, this would have been around 2016. At that time, there was only maybe five programs or less varsity programs in all of North America. Um, so I used them as kind of a, a template of what we could maybe do. And, you know, they jumped at the opportunity to become Canada's first varsity program. And so we were able to officially launch and start competing in September of 2017 uh, with our first varsity team. So. We're going into our sixth year now as a varsity program. Um, and uh, in that time, we've grown quite a bit. Uh, we started with around six teams back in 2017. Now this year, we'll have somewhere around 18 teams between our varsity level and our academy level. Um, our varsity level, we're able to offer up to full, uh, full, full ride scholarships, essentially which includes like full tuition. And even um, just starting this year, we were able to offer free housing to um, some international students as well. Um, our, <laughs> our, <yeah. laughs> um, our academy level, we offer kind of like a blanket, um, like 25% tuition um, across the board. Um, that's 25% tuition, like domestic uh, tuition rate. So we're able to offer that like a blanket um, offer to our academy level. So we have about... I think 65 or 70 players in our academy program this year, and then about uh, 35 to 40 in our varsity program uh, this year. And we've got um, five full-time staff members in the esports varsity side. Uh, and then we have an additional full-time staff member um, on our academic side, which speaking of academics in 2019, that's when we launched our two-year diploma esports administration and entrepreneurship program. Um, and so we've had, I think four or five intakes by now. This year we have around 50 students that are entering into that two-year program uh, starting up this September. And students in that program are, are learning kind of a mixture of business, marketing, esports, content creation, tournament, event management, all those kind of skills that can, you know, maybe not, it's more focused on the people that want to work in the industry, whereas our varsity program is kind of focused on the people that want to compete. So we're, right. we're trying to build programs that can cater to every type of, um, interest in the esports world. So those two programs combined are really kind of what have what kind of allowed us to um, grow over the years, um, especially the fact that they're kind of really they intermingle quite a bit. A lot of our students working in the academic program are supporting our varsity program and vice versa. Um, so yeah, that's kind of it. Uh, the big news for us recently uh, is just last Wednesday, August 24th, we uh, opened up our new esports facility called the esports nexus and um, basically state-of-the-art esports facility i think it's the largest esports facility in canada right now um and when it comes to esports facilities uh at college on college campuses or university campuses we're probably one of only maybe four or five schools at most in north america that have something like this um you know just a couple other programs in the u.s that have something similar so we're really kind of ahead of the game and my goal is to hopefully um, over the next few years really help elevate Canadian schools to catch up to us because I, re I really do think there's a big opportunity for esports in the post-secondary level in Canada right now um, and we are starting to finally see some schools really understand that and, and you know really grow. Um, we recently announced uh, I've been working with some other directors at other schools in Canada and we recently launched um, esports Canada post-secondary. So we're partnered with Esport Canada, which for the past several years has really been focused on uh, like the high school and middle school level. But now we've partnered with them to launch a collegiate level as well. 
And the goal of that really is just kind of elevate esports at colleges and universities around the country. And I think it's already been helping to do that. But that was a little, really big, long ramble oh, about cool. various <laughs> things. But I, I figure I'm probably just answering some of your questions before you get to them. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, uh, so just on that note that, you know, you said that this is the first time actually I've heard that there is an esports organization for high school and middle schools. Uh, so like, what do they do for those kids? I think it's just kind of bringing some legitimacy to it. Um, it's, it's primarily, I would say, focused on education at this stage. So there's a lot of high schools out there or middle schools out there that have heard about esports or competitive video gaming from their students, but they don't know what it is and they don't know how to start. So Esport Canada, I think that's one of the primary responsibilities of the organization is to help educate, um, you know, teachers at those schools and to help, you know, them start programs, you know? So um, I know, for example, they're, they're long, they have like provincial um, organizations under the umbrella. So here in Ontario, there's the, uh, I think it's called the Ontario Federation of, secondary esports association i forget exactly what it stands for but it's ofsea and they basically are like running competitions for high school level um programs across the province i think last year they had a league of legends tournament and a rocket league tournament um both with you know somewhere around 30 to 40 schools competing and i i expect over the next few years that that number will just blow up we'll probably uh, we'll probably have you know hundreds of high schools competing over the next few years in esports. So, I think that's kind of the probably the major role for uh, Esport Canada right now is that education piece. That's the biggest kind of hurdle right now is educating teachers on what it is and how to start. But programs. also hosting the tournaments. Uh, well, I think Esport Canada itself doesn't actually host the tournaments, but they sort of empower other organizations to host tournaments. But I could be wrong there. Okay. Um, if you're interested in learning more about Esport Canada, I would. I can put you in touch with Melissa Burns. Uh, she runs um, that organization and she'll have a much better, more eloquent way of, sure, of explaining be, what they do. But yeah, uh, <laughs> let me know and I can put you in touch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, man, just hearing about all this makes me go like, oh man, I was born like 15 years too early. It's like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 anyways, so um, uh, you mentioned you started esports back in 2010, 2011. That's basically when at least in north america esports was really really in its infancy so like mm -hmm. were you like what were you involved in what games were you involved in um and how yeah you so with them? i think like so i i'm also a teacher in esports so i can give you a little bit of the history but 2009 was pretty much when um collegiate star league launched and it was focused primarily on starcraft 2 at that time and so by 2010 2011 starcraft 2 was still kind of the uh the esport at the college level um it's kind of crazy to think about now because it's really fallen in, into almost like irrelevancy in collegiate, but really was kind of the game that started everything. Um, and then shortly thereafter, in you know, 2011, 2012, that's when you saw League of Legends start to rise up. Um, and then obviously Counter-Strike has kind of been in the mix that whole time as well. So those are kind of the, the games early on. Me personally, I actually was more of a console gamer back in those days. So I started competing mostly on like halo 3 halo reach and like call of duty modern warfare and those games and um you know my role like i partnered with the it uh club at the university of windsor and we started running tournaments i would kind of focus on the console stuff they would kind of build out the land parties um and we'd kind of merge everything together to make it one big event you know and that kind of was how i learned and discovered esports and we realized wait there's collegiate leagues how about we run tryouts let's start a starcraft team let's start a league of legends team let's represent the school in these leagues um, and that's really how i got my start in it and um you know fast forward a few years later and then i was got the opportunity to start the program at, at st Clair, and i jumped at it because it's just something i love and that i'm passionate about and I'm not really a, an amazing gamer. Like I'd say, usually I'm around average. Like if I pick up a game and play, I can I can generally get to like that gold plat level in whatever game I want. But you know, I know I'm never going to compete and win. But what I well, what I did realize is that I have a knack for organizing and managing teams and events and that kind of thing. So I realized pretty early on that instead of trying to play these games and compete, why don't I enable other people to do that? And you know, why don't I use my the skill set that that I have and and help other people that are better players than I am at, you know, going out there and winning championships. So uh, that's kind of how I, I got involved. 
Just out of, out of my own person, just for my own personal curiosity, does Saint Clair uh, Esports have any StarCraft involvement? Not currently. Um, although you know, so this year I mentioned like we we opened up our new facility, and because of that, we had a lot more space, and so we launched our academy program, which unlocked the ability for us to offer way more titles than we have in the past. So you know, this year you know we've got an Apex Legends team for the first time, for example. We have you know an iRacing racing team. You know. Um, so is there a possibility that StarCraft can come back? Absolutely. You know, if, if we try to respond to students' interest, so if all of a sudden we had some StarCraft players come to us and say, you know, we want to start a team, you know, we are, this is the game we compete in, we want to play, we want to represent St. Clair, we would ex explore that with them and see if we can find a way to make them a part of our program in some way. I see, I see. So what would you say the, the main distribution is right now in terms of uh, titles? Top game. So if we're looking at collegiate as a whole, I would say the number one game and people will dispute me on this, but the number one collegiate game right now is Rocket League. Um, by basically every metric, they have the highest participation, the highest viewership on Twitch, um, some of the best support from the developers. So I would say Rocket League is, is number one. Number two is probably League of Legends um, still. So it's kind of been hanging on for quite a while now uh, in that top level. Number three is going to be arguable this year. It used to be pretty clear cut uh, Overwatch as number three, but I, I do think Valorant will probably uh, overtake it this year and be the third collegiate game. And then you've got Overwatch and Call of Duty kind of rounding out the top five, I'd say. And then, you know, a lot of other games have a presence, but after that top five, it really starts to Drop. fall off pretty, pretty quickly. Um, and you don't see nearly as much participation um, for, for other titles. Right. And, and uh, one game that I would say is somewhat um, universally popular, but I, from what I see, doesn't get very much eSport involvement is Dota 2. What yeah, is your... Dota 2 is interesting in North America because it's, I think um, Dota 2 is huge in other areas of the world. Like Asia, it's huge. South America, it's huge. Parts of, Asia, uh, parts of Europe, it's huge. But North America, it really does play second fiddle to League of Legends. So, you know, it, it just doesn't have the the interest in North America as it does in those other parts of the world. Uh, I've been discussing this with my, you know, my staff here as well, that we do see that there could be an opportunity with Dota 2. There's a school in Michigan called Davenport University, and they realized a couple of years ago that they could really heavily lean into CSGO, which for a lot of schools has started to be a, a team that has been cut. Um, and I'll be honest, we had to kind of cut it here at St. Clair as well to kind of put resources in, into Valorant and other titles like this that were on the, on the rise. But they found this niche of leaning into CSGO and they've done really, really well with it. Um, and I do think that like Dota 2 is a game that's prime um, for a similar type of, uh, you know, a similar type of opportunity for a school to kind of latch onto it and really kind of, um, you know, build themselves up as like the Dota 2 school. I do think there's an opportunity for it. Um, but uh, we'll see if someone does it. It's, it's a game that, again, if, if I was to have a bunch of Dota 2 players come to me and say, we want a team at St. Clair, you know, I would definitely try to help them do that, whether it be probably at first at the club level with some kind of minor support. And then if they really kind of showed that they knew uh, that they could take this seriously and treat it professionally, then I would I'd absolutely be looking to elevate them up to a ca academy and then maybe even up to varsity. Right. So, um Here's a question that I have, and I'm not really sure how it works, but I think that might be good because maybe with some of our listeners will have the same sort of brain fuzz. But um, so, you know, some people, they attend schools for, you know, sports in general. You know what I mean? Like they will like attend to play hockey. You know, they'll be there on like a hockey scholarship or something like that, right? Um, mm -hmm. they're not really there to learn. Like, is that, a, is that offered as a major is what I'm asking? Like when people do varsity, is it like there, it's like, you know, if somebody's there to be like a hockey player and get drafted for the NHL, you know, are they there on a, they're there on a hockey scholarship, but like, what kind of degree are they studying? It's definitely a variety. So uh, that's definitely like a little bit of a misnomer. Like people look at esports and they think, oh, everybody in the varsity esports team is probably also taking the esports academic diploma program because we have both. But the reality is it's probably more about like, it's probably around 20% of our varsity players enroll in the esports academic program. And the rest are taking a variety of things. Like we've had, we've had esports varsity players that are taking 
culinary, nursing, you know, biomedical. Um, we've had a welding, somebody in the welding program. We've had somebody in electrical me mechanical program. So they really are studying a diverse uh, subject matter. And esports is just kind of like the thing that they like to do as a hobby. And some of them do have ambitions of trying to push for pro. Like we do, I wouldn't say it's a huge number, but we probably do have somewhere around like 10 to 25% of our players that they do have an ambition of using collegiate as a stepping stone to eventually go pro. Right. Um, and, and what's interesting about esports is it's even the, the opposite as well sometimes. So we've even had former pro players that come back to college now. So they're, you know, they went pro, um, you know, they were very successful, but then, you know, now they're looking to move on in a different direction in their life. So then they come back to school and they're basically using esports to afford school to then go oh, and, okay. and build a career for themselves. Right. So you've got a variety of different people uh, that are joining the program for different reasons, you know, and then even for others, like we have students that if it wasn't for esports, they probably wouldn't come to school. You know, we have students that they, they have no interest in school, but esports is the reason that they're here. And then a lot of times, it becomes like this situation where they didn't want to come to school, but when while they're here, they learn that yes, that actually they do like being a student, and they end up you know doing well academically. Or I even have students that started in the esports administration program, um, graduated from that, and now they're working on a bachelor's degree. And if you were to go back two years ago before they enrolled and ask them, do you think you'll ever get a bachelor's degree? They probably would have said no. So I think it's been like a, a great bridge to just get students into an academic mindset in the first place. So it's accomplished a lot of things and students kind of utilize, use esports in a variety of ways. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a little bit of uh, misunderstanding about like what it is and what it can do. Sometimes people think it's only STEM majors that play esports, but it's not the case. Like I have, I have people in such a wide variety of subject matter that are all interested in, um, you know, coming to school to use esports as you know part of their social life or uh, another just kind of way of engaging with college and student life so uh th that being said using the college you know the collegiate level as a stepping stone um so you know like like i said earlier uh you know some people they go to university they're in the hockey club you know Harvey hockey varsity and they get drafted for the nhl and like that's how like that's the bridge for them like how does it work from college to pro because like you know usually when people like scout players they're looking at like tournaments and open brackets and like people who break through there um and you know there's like less of an eye for the collegiate level so can you explain how that how that goes yeah, it's definitely, you know, not something that's quite built out, fleshed out yet. Like, really, if you're looking, you know, the vast majority of pro players got there not through collegiate. Like, it's just the reality of it. But I do see that number increasing over time. Uh, and the reason why is if you look across the landscape, you look at the tier two uh, levels of any of the big esports titles, they're all struggling right now. You know, you look at like tier two Call of Duty, they held their challengers division in like a gym that, you know, it, their setup for their challengers championships is something that, you know, like pales in comparison to what I was building 10 years ago in terms of like a LAN, right? So they just don't have the money or the resources to support tier two, the developmental level. Um, and this is almost unanimously true against uh, across all of the titles you know so where i see it going and where a lot of us in the space see it going is that collegiate will fill that that need um long term and it already is starting to do that um i don't necessarily have players from my school uh from our program that have gone pro just yet but you know you look at programs like maryville and harrisburg and um illinois state uh, they they had last year multiple players go to Overwatch League, multiple players that are getting picked up, you know, by LCS teams or at least by LCS Academy teams. So you're seeing it start to happen, and it seems like every year it's just the number of those more players getting picked up is getting more and more. Right. So um, you, you mentioned earlier when we were speaking that you were at the uh, I don't know if I'm quite remembering this right, like uh, the Canadian Commonwealth Games or so yeah, the Commonwealth Games basically is like, it's kind of like a mini Olympics for every country that is a part of the British Commonwealth. So oh, okay. like former colonies of, you know, the British <laughs> Empire, basically. Yeah. yeah. So, so Canada is one of those former colonies. So um, 
Canada competes in the Commonwealth Games every four years, and this year the Commonwealth Games added an esports tournament, um, kind of like as a test. It wasn't like a full medaled game just yet, uh, or full medal competitions just yet, but they're testing it out because they want it to be in the long run something included. So we were lucky enough. We played in a qualifier tournament and we ended up being the top placing Canadian team. And so we got selected. Uh, our, our our Rocket League team got selected to represent Team Canada and travel to the United Kingdom to compete in that. Um, unfortunately, we didn't make it out of the group stages. We got we we were able to beat India, but we lost to England and to Wales. Um, they ended up going on to be the the gold and silver medal team. So we lost to the gold and silver medal team. So at least we can kind of use that as like a, you know, like a little bit of a silver lining um, that we lost to the two best teams. But um, yeah, unfortunately we didn't, we finished in the, I guess what will be equivalent to fifth place at, at the games. Um, you know, we hope to do a little bit better, but it was great just getting to go there and represent team Canada in the first place. And I think it's something that we can build on for the future. And, you know, maybe some of our, our players will get to participate next time. I think, in four years, it's going to be in Australia. So hopefully uh, we'll have some players that get to represent Team Canada then. It's like once per degree. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And I mean, they do other competitions in between. Like team, like from talking with the people that are that are kind of getting Team, organi- team Canada organized, like there's going to be some other international competitions between then. Just the Commonwealth Games only happen every four years. But like even, for example, the Olympics is looking at esports and they have been for a couple of olympic cycles now so i think you know it's getting closer and closer and it probably i can almost guarantee you it's probably uh it probably has to do with negotiations with developers like if riot games was to approach the ioc and say we want riot games to be or we want league of legends to be a a medaled event like i think i think the olympic committee would jump at it personally um but i think it's probably the developers that are that are kind of standing in the way right now but sorry that's just kind of speculation but i do i do think like what do you think that is though i i see there's kind of this weird situation right because like right now um riot games controls their game they get they control the whole environment around league of legends you know so as soon as they were to sign with somebody like the ioc now all of a sudden the ioc Uh. is going to want to take some of that control and do they want to relinquish control of their game and how it's treated to an outside group like they just don't that's just the reality of it you know so even in in collegiate esports like riot runs it all everything flows through riot for league of legends collegiate you know, other leagues that try to run stuff without permission from Riot get shut down. They get cease and desist noticed, you know, so um, it's just the reality of it. So I think that's probably has to do with it. That's even why, like, for example, with the Commonwealth Games we just went to, the, the titles were, uh, the main titles supported there were Rocket League, Dota 2, and um, uh, what was it called? eFootball. So like a soccer game. Oh, okay. And the reason why they didn't have League of Legends or Valorant or Overwatch is because I'm. I can guarantee the developers didn't want it to be an event at the Commonwealth Games. Um, you know, because I'm sure League of Legends was probably one of their top picks, but they just weren't able to get the license to do it. You know. Right. Right. So, um, with the collegiate, you know, circuits that St. Clair Esports is involved with. Um, I've noticed that a lot of uh, circuits these days are, you know, like. A, region restricted you know like for example the commonwealth games restricted to commonwealth countries and you know there there are some that are just restricted to north america do you have any that are international right now i think the only the only one that we've competed in that's international um is rocket league so rocket league does for collegiate did um like we compete in the crl which is the north american circuit for it for the regular season but then this year they had crl like they had the collegiate rocket league world championships in Dallas. And we, as we finished third in, um, I think we finished, I'm like, I might be remembering correct, miss correctly, but like we finished top three, I think in, um, North America. And so we were invited to worlds and they invited teams from Europe to go, to go and compete there as well. Um, and I think they have intentions on adding more regions in the future. So next year, if they do CRL Worlds again, you might see teams from South America. Maybe you'll see teams from Asia. I'm not quite sure like where they're going to invite teams from, but they're probably the first organization to try to kind of 
um, go down that international route, at least at the collegiate level. But you're right, most collegiate leagues we compete in are just North American. And the reason, the major reason why is really because of server connection. Like, uh, oh, if yeah, you're going to, okay. <laughs> you know, like, you don't want to play a match against, like, a European team. Like, you're going to have, like, 200, 300 ping or whatever, and it just it won't be fun for anybody, right? But yeah. I do see some situations long term where, you know, the winners from North America could go up against the winners from Europe out of LAN. You know, I right. think more of that will happen as more money and resources become available for those types of things to exist. Right, right. So um, in regards to St. Clair College on its own, it sounds like to me that some people are choosing, I mean, this might sound really obvious, but I, I've got to ask it anyways, uh, that people are choosing St. Clair College just for the esports program. Would you Absolutely they are. Yeah, so like, we opened up, I mentioned, we opened up our new facilities on Wednesday and we posted a video to TikTok, just like a little kind of video tour of the facility. And that video had over 100K views in like just a matter of hours. Um, and at the same time, my assistant director who tracks our application, he was tracking the number. And <laughs> in the first hour since that posted, we received 30 new applications for our varsity teams. You know, generally we get trickle in like one to two new applications a day. That day we got 30 just in like within the first couple hours, you know, so it's very evident that, you know, like esports is a reason that people want to choose one school over another. Like that's just like very evident. Um, even after that as well, we had people just jumping into our Discord server and saying like, how do I enroll here? How do I come here? <laughs> just based on seeing a video of our facility, you know, so it's very evident that it, it does work. You know, our program, we have um, players this year coming. We have a player that just arrived yesterday from Germany. We have two players coming from the UK. We have players from the US. We have another player from Israel. Um, like our, our school doesn't generally bring in students from those countries. Like our school, the, the majority of the population is local, like, you know, like commuter students. Yeah. So we're able to kind of bring in international students or like, you know, students from all over Canada now is, is not something our school normally does. And esports is, is doing that. Okay. So I'm going to wrap up our interview here shortly, but I'm going to ask a couple more questions before I do that. Uh, question, sure. um, how did you get such a lead compared to other Canadian universities and how do you maintain that? I think it's a combination of just really strategizing really well, um, and but also having the support of, you know, champions here at the college. So when I joined, I was lucky enough to find, you know, a champion. Uh, his name was Don France. He actually just retired on Wednesday, um, but he, you know, brought me under his wing and kind of helped guide me through the college and how to push things through and get the resources we need. And then on the other side, on the, on the, so he's under the, he was uh, the general manager or the executive director of the student union. And then I also have, uh, he's a dean of the School of Business, and he was a former mentor of mine from when I was in business school. His name is Jim Marsh. And so between those two kind of champions on campus, uh, I've been able to kind of secure the resources we need to build our program. Um, most schools are struggling with finding people like that on campus. You know, like I've, I talk with a lot of students who, you know, I talk with students at some Canadian clubs, uh, like some Canadian schools, they have a club with, 300 esports players in their club and they go to their administration and they say we want some support can you give us 500 dollars to enter a tournament and the school says no you know like so what we're seeing is like a, this giant disconnect at a lot of schools where the administration just doesn't understand it yet um, and the students haven't been able to uh, convince them of the idea yet so i think part of it was me luckily um, having the knowledge and the experience and the ability to sell the idea of an esports program, and then also having the right people there ready to listen and understand and work with me to to get the resources we need to build what we've what we've built. I see, and uh, and I you know I guess the maintaining part is a little easier when you're already so far ahead, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't like to. So that word "maintain" that's kind of like a word I hate because okay. I don't, I don't ever want to maintain. I want to keep growing, right? So, uh -huh, uh -huh. you know, like I, I, I talk about this with my staff every day. Like we easily could have just, you know, rested on our laurels and been fine with the program that we started in 2017. Well, and well just, I mean, maintain your first yeah. place status. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. We're, well, what what helps me is as other schools grow, you know, and some other schools start to develop, I can use them as, you know evidence to show ammo to show my administration oh. like look we don't want these people to catch up if you, want, <laughs> you know like if you don't want them to catch up then i need this i need that i need a new building or whatever it's funny <laughs> so, so like 
some people will ask me that, like, why are you helping these other schools? Why don't you just like keep your lead? I'm like, because if I help them, it helps me indirectly, right? So, right, right. you know, it's it's kind of like a it's kind of a win win for everybody. Like, I'll help right. everybody, give them all of my knowledge because as they grow, that's I can just use that to just continue to grow our program as well. Right. And um, uh, last question, what sort of advice would you give people who are trying to, you know, uh, push in esports administration, perhaps, you know, at the collegiate collegiate level? I'd say just in general is just get involved. Um, You know, like I have a lot of students that are very smart students. They have a lot of knowledge. They know games inside and out. Some of them are very good at games. But they uh, they don't get involved enough, and so they think that they can just kind of go to class, go through the motions, get their degree or the diploma, and then they'll just apply to jobs and get the jobs. But that's just not the reality. Like the people that are building careers and working in esports, they're the people that from day one found opportunities to just get involved as you know, whether it be a volunteer or like a small contract or you know some sort of small position, and they use that first position to leapfrog to another position to leapfrog to another position. So, you know, that's really important. Day one, you know, get involved in and talk with people and network and um, find opportunities to build your resume. Gotcha. Sounds good. Thanks so much for your time, Sean. And yeah, uh, absolutely. So awesome to hear what's going on over at St. Clair College. Yeah. Anytime. I will catch you later. Talk to you later. Bye. (laughs) 